All right, welcome back, everybody. I hope you <clears throat> enjoyed our first talk. And here comes our second one. Uh, Anastasia Brooks is a student in the class of 2023. And her <clears throat> talk will be titled, uh, The Geometry of Simplicial Complexes and the Quantification of Power. Take it away. Okay, thank you. Um, the, yes, this is my... Uh my talk. Uh, I worked with Professor Volitz this summer to do research about um, quantifying power. And to start off, we were really interested in um, weighted voting systems, uh, because those are generally the more interesting voting systems than when everyone's fair and equal. Uh, so weighted voting systems are voting systems where participants have different number of votes. And as such, they have different amounts of power. So we can think about the electoral college as a weighted voting system where each state uh, is one voter with a certain number of votes. So Texas is one state or one voter with 38 votes. Oklahoma is one voter with seven votes. Um, and we can see how much power uh, each of these states has. There are two main uh, indices we used uh, to model how much power voters had. You have to kind of pick what you want to quantify to pick how much to do to measure how much power someone has because it is generally, it's not a black and white thing. And so the first index we worked with is called the Bonzoff Index created by Lionel Penrose and uh, John Bonzoff. Uh, and that measures power as how often a voter is critical, which is how often a voter, when they are uh, part of a winning coalition or a winning group of voters, how often if that voter left, would that group then become non-winning So that vote that voter is critical to the success of the coalition. So as, as an example of that index, uh, say we have a system with five voters, A through E, with all different um, weighted votes. And with 15 votes, the quota is eight. So just over half to pass or elect something. Now, out of all possible coalitions of votes, there are 12 coalitions um, that could win, including the coalition of voters A, B, C, and D. And it's winning because adding all their votes together gives you 10, which is above the quota. But if we look at who's critical, voter A or voter B could both leave the coalition and the total number of votes in the coalition would still be above the quota. So whatever they were voting on would still pass. So they're not critical. But if either voter C or voter D left the coalition, then the voter, the coalition would no longer pass. And so, the voter C and D are both critical. So we go through all coalitions, uh, tallying up any time any of the voters is, um, is critical. And then that's how we make the index. It, that's how we make the index for the voters. And if you look at the chart, it might, I think at least when I started this, because when I started this, I did not know anything about these um, indices. I thought that weighted, when you had weighted voting, your power was equivalent to your, or proportional to the number of votes you had but this index shows that that's not quite the case. So while voters A and B both had, they have the least amount of votes, so it makes sense that it's generally still proportional to an extent where they had the lowest, um, the least amount of power. While A and B had different number of votes, their power was still the same. So effectively, they could have had the same number of votes. It didn't actually matter that voter B had more votes. Um, and same thing with voters C and D. And they, each in actuality had the same amount of power, even though voter C only had three votes and voter D only had four. So that's how the bounds off index generally works. And the second index we used is called the shapley schubick index made by Lloyd Shapley and Martin Schubick. This is about 10 years later. And um, Martin, they did this because they didn't think the bounds off index was comprehensive enough. So the way this one is different is that the shapley schubick index takes into account the order in which voters join a coalition. Um, and so here where the Banzoff measured how often a voter was critical, the keyword here is pivotal. And it's asking uh, how often a voter is pivotal or how often in the order that they join the coalition are how often are they the one that turns the coalition from um, losing to winning. And because every winning coalition whether it's the second voter or the last voter, if it's winning, some voter had to be the one that tips them over the edge. Every coalition has 
at least one pivotal voter. So in this example, we have a similar setup where there are five voters with different weights. Um, the quota is 12 to pass anything. And this ordered coalition starts with voter C joining first, then voter A, then E, then D. And we denote that with the, um, the carrots, I guess, the brackets. When we just had the first voter, um, voter C, the weight of the whole coalition was just three. So it was not enough to pass. When A joined it now, the weight of the coalition went up to seven, still not enough. But when voter E joined with their, five, with their seven votes, the weight of the coalition went up to 14 votes, which then passed the quota. And because voter E was the one that tipped the coalition from losing to winning, they are the pivotal voter. And that would count as one mark for them. And so finding out which, um, well, like what your index is, is just asking how many times each voter was pivotal. So the issue with these um, indexes, or at least what, what we have decided is their issue, is that it assumes all coalitions are possible because theoretically all voters could vote with every other voter. But in actuality, there are lots of coalitions that won't actually happen. If you think about Congress, like the Senate or the House, there are certain members that are so ideologically different that they will never vote together on anything or different you know, parliaments with different parties. There are certain parties that are so different that they will never vote together. And so if we are considering those coalitions in our index, it's not as accurate as it could be because it's counting coalitions that don't actually exist. So our goal is to model um, coalitions differently so we can only count the ones that would actually happen. The way we do this is with simplicial complexes. So a simplex is basically a triangle in every dimension. The cool thing about triangles is that every point, every vertex is connected to every other vertex. And so we take that trait, we call it a simplex. And so, um, you know, a six dimensional simplex is the simplex with seven different vertex vertices and they're all connected to each other. And so we use this to model um, like a coalition of voters because all voters in a coalition are all voting with each other. And a simplicial complex is just an amalgamation of simplexes. So you might have uh, two simplicities sharing an edge or a face, um, but we use these to model voters. And we do this by the next example. If we have a voting system with six voters, um, the assumption on the left would be that all voters would vote with each other. So every voter is connected to every other voter. But in reality, voters zero, one, and two would never vote with voters four, five, and six. But voter three would go either way, kind of a swing voter. So in actuality, using simplicial complexes, um, the image on the right is what the coalitions would actually look like. And if we are measuring power, we should only take into consideration those coalitions. So here are the um, equations for the Banzoff and the shapley schubik indexes for weighted and unweighted systems where we take into account only certain um, coalitions, which is kind of fancy, thought I'd throw them up there. Um, but basically a lot of the terminology that they're using is terminology from simplicial complexes. So it's all topology terminology um, and a lot of summations because we're just going through every possible coalition and adding up um, what we're going through. But that was really cool. And that was what we started off the summer trying to figure out. And then that came not too far along. And so then we started working on making a calculator uh, for these coalitions so we could actually put them into use because these equations are really cool, but doing them by hand is still kind of brutal. So this is just, again, some of our code that we wrote. I have not written code since high school uh, and not in Python, and this isn't Python. And so we started writing this calculator with a bunch of um, a bunch of different methods and different and there was recursive calls at one point. And I it was really like getting thrown in the deep end, but it was really cool to get to learn how to do this. Um, and using this calculator, we got to calculate bigger, more complicated systems. So going back to that first example about how you can look at the electoral college as a college of, or sorry, as a system of weighted voters. Um, we can look at 
the states as votes with weighted voters. And here we're looking at swing states. We originally tried to run the shapley shubik index um, for just all 50 states, then see how they all uh, kind of shook out. But basically, that would end up being 50 factorial coalitions that we would have to go through. And 50 factorial is about a 67 digit number. And um, our lowly computers did time out and just stop running and freeze and we had to reboot them. So we had to figure out another way to attack this, um, at least for now, while we didn't, while we have um, only, you know, our lowly MacBook Airs. So what we did was we grouped all solidly red states into uh, a group together into one coalition and added up all of their weights. And we also collected um, one coalition of solidly blue states and said that they were going to vote together, or that, that all of the blue, solidly blue states would vote together. And these identified 13 identified swing states were our, um, like what we would leave in the middle because they could vote with the red states or the blue states. But we, we felt confident grouping the red and blue states together because a solidly blue state like California is nowhere in the near future going to ever actually vote with Alabama or Oklahoma. And so it wasn't, it was still going along with kind of our, our process of eliminating certain coalitions. And so if we look at the original bonds off index and how much power each of these have, and the percentages are because we're saying Arizona has 2% of the power in the system. And that's what these percentages mean. So when we modify them, and I think there's another chart in the next slide. Yes. Um, the original bounds off index gives these states much lower percentages. But then once we modify it, we say that the, actually these states could be in much many more coalitions than solidly red states or solidly blue states. Their percentage of power goes up because they're swing states, like they swing elections. Um, and just because, you know, Georgia only has a certain number of votes doesn't mean that their voting doesn't really impact the election. And so we use these, we used our calculators um, to model these, and that was really cool when we got these numbers. Um, and we also used it to model um, this, which is another kind of example. It's a little bit different where it's not necessarily voting right, voting, a voting system, but Relations from the Middle East are very tenuous and certain countries will work with some countries, but not others, or some countries, but not with other countries. And so we use this as an example where there were, um, you know, you just need two countries to agree on something for something to happen. And so while technically, yes, any country could hypothetically deal, like agree with another country and deal with them, um, in actuality, you know, Israel and Egypt were not going to agree with each other. And so taking out the coalitions where, where they would makes it more accurate. And so if you look at the way these are modeled, so I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the A5, A7, and A8, so Egypt, Iraq, and the US would all agree with each other. So that's why they're one simplex, they're one triangle. Um, but there's nothing connecting here again, uh, Egypt and Israel or Israel and Iran. So, but there is something connecting Iran, um, Syria and Iraq. So that the three of them together are one simplex and one coalition. And so again, kind of looking at this, the shapley shubik index takes into account the fact that not all coalitions are possible and you can only allow some and really adjusts how much power they each have. So Iraq has the most power because if you look at the slide, Iraq, it can vote can agree and make alliances with the most other countries. And so because they can be part of the most coalitions, they end up having a lot more power um, in the Middle East than one might think initially. Um, and then certain factions like Al Qaeda and ISIS don't really work with anyone. And so because of that, they end up not having any power. Um, another way, so that we could continue this research and that we are looking at continuing it um, before the summer ended. And also I've been working on it some, um, I've been working on it this past semester too, is by adding probability into um, this idea of coalitions because we can certainly say that some coalitions will never happen and some coalitions will happen. But sometimes certain coalitions will happen with different degrees of probability. And sometimes certain voters will join, be a part of two, two possible coalitions, but join one coalition 90% of the time 
and only join the other coalition 10% of the time. And so if we can work on how to put probability um, in either of those scenarios, then again, we can make it more accurate. And also certain coalitions as a whole may or may not agree with each other depending on what the issue is. Um, Cause as you know, climate change or whatever else happens and people vote on it, some voters may agree on some and vote together, but never on others. Um, so adding probability can definitely help. And one of the more recent papers about the bonds off index is, um, is here, the one we've cited. And it was really cool and really interesting and like talking about how probability could be added to specifically the bands off index. Um, and, oh no, why is it not? Okay. And then, yeah, these were the works we used. Sorry, I went through this kind of fast. Um, and I just wanna say thank you so much uh, to Professor Rolich for being my advisor. And uh, thank you to the Wellesley Summer Science Research Program for giving us the funding to do this. It was, it's been really, really cool to get to know, get to learn and do research for the first time and um, really learn so much about this because I knew nothing about simplicial complexes or these indices at all before learning. And it's now something that I'm really interested in. So thank you. Thank you very much, Anastasia. That was a, a lovely talk. Does anybody have any questions? If you do, feel free to shout out. While people are thinking about questions, I should just say that uh, Anastasia worked with Ava Mock also in the summer, so she was uh, our, in, in our group, but she's moved on to other things, so Anastasia took, took over. Just today in my math and politics class, I was, I was, you know, I was talking about these power indices, and there, you know, you can, you can pick your favorite uh, political system in the world and sort of run this power index calculation, uh, it's just like some cool stuff happens, like you can Tell about how much, for example, one of the standard examples is uh, uh, the UN Security Council. So you can calculate the power of each of the members of the UN Security Council. And it's very telling. It really reveals certain dynamics that are not uh, immediately apparent on the face of just the UN Security Council. Or like the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, or the European Parliament, or, you know, as an Anastasia explained, the Electoral College, etc. So this is really a really a cool topic with, with lots of lots of applications, but I'll let someone else ask a question. Any additional questions for Anastasia? All right, well, let's give uh, Anastasia another round of applause. And we have a little bit of time before our next talk, which will be at five, is that right? <laughs>